Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our net asset purchases. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we confirm that our net asset purchases at the new monthly pace of 60 billion euros are intended to run until the end of December 2017, or beyond if necessary, and in any case until the Governing Council sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with its inflation aim. The net purchases will be made alongside reinvestments of the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the asset purchase program. Our monetary policy measures have continued to preserve the very favorable financing conditions that are necessary to secure a sustained convergence of inflation rates towards levels below but close to 2% over the medium term. Incoming data since our meeting in early March confirm that the cyclical recovery of the euro area economy is becoming increasingly solid and that downside risks have further diminished. At the same time, underlying inflation pressures continue to remain subdued and have yet to show a convincing upward trend. Moreover, the ongoing volatility in headline inflation underlines the need to look through transient developments in HICP inflation, which have no implication for the medium-term outlook for price stability. A very substantial degree of monetary accommodation is still needed for underlying inflation pressures to build up and support headline inflation in the medium term. If the outlook becomes less favorable, or if financial conditions become inconsistent with further progress towards a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation, we stand ready to increase our asset purchase program in terms of size and or duration. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.5% quarter on quarter in the fourth quarter of 2016, following a growth rate of 0.4% in the third quarter. Incoming data, notably survey results, bolster our confidence that the ongoing economic expansion will continue to firm and broaden. The pass-through of our monetary policy measures is supporting domestic demand and facilitates the ongoing deleveraging process. The recovery in investment continues to benefit from very favorable financing conditions and improvements in corporate profitability. Employment gains which are also benefiting from past labor market reforms, are supporting real disposable income and private consumption. Moreover, the signs of a stronger global recovery and increasing global trade suggest that foreign demand should increasingly add to the overall resilience of the economic expansion in the euro area. However, Economic growth continues to be dampened by a sluggish pace of implementation of structural reforms, in particular in product markets, 
and by remaining balance sheet adjustment needs in a number of sector, sectors. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook while moving towards a more balanced configuration are still tilted to the downside and related predominantly to global factors. Headline inflation has been recovering from the very low levels seen in 2016, largely owing to higher energy price increases. After reaching 2% in February 2017, Euro area annual HICP inflation stood at 1.5% in March. This reflected mainly lower energy and unprocessed food price inflation, but also a decline in services price inflation. Looking ahead on the basis of current futures price for oil, headline inflation is likely to increase in April and thereafter to hover around current levels until the end of this year. However, as unutilized resources are still weighing on domestic wage and price formation, measures of underlying inflation remain low and are expected to rise only gradually over the medium term, supported by our monetary policy measures, the expected continuing economic recovery and the corresponding gradual absorption of slack. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3 continues to expand at a robust pace with an annual rate of growth of 4.7% in February 2017 after 4.8% in January. As in previous months, annual growth in M3 was mainly supported by its most liquid components with a narrow monetary aggregate M1 expanding at an annual rate of 8.4% in February 2017, unchanged from the previous month. The recovery in loan growth to the private sector observed since the beginning of 2014 is proceeding. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations declined to 2% in February 2017 from 2.3% in the previous month, while the annual growth rate of loans to households remained broadly stable at 2.3% in February. At the same time, the Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the first quarter of 2017 indicates that the net loan demand has increased and bank lending conditions have further eased across all loan categories. The pass-through of the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continues to significantly support borrowing conditions for firms and households and credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed the need for a continued very substantial degree of monetary accommodation to secure a sustained return of inflation rates towards levels that are below but close to 2% without undue delay. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute much more decisively to strengthening economic growth. The implementation of structural reforms needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost productivity and potential output growth. Regarding fiscal policies, all countries should intensify efforts towards achieving a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. A full and consistent implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact and of the macroeconomic imbalances procedure over time and across countries remains crucial to enhance the resilience 
of the euro area economy. And we are now at your disposal for questions. Ms. Jones. Claire Jones, Financial Times, thank you. Um, Mr. Draghi, was there any support today from members of the council to say that the risks to the outlook were now balanced rather than to the downside, or was that a majority view? And should Emmanuel Macron secure victory on May the 7th, would you then regard the risks to the economic outlook as balanced? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the answer to the second question first, um, we actually don't do monetary policy based on uh, likely election outcomes. On, but on the first question, uh, we actually had a, a discussion on exactly on the balance of risks as far as growth is concerned, not inflation. That's an important distinction that I want to mark. Um, and some of the members were, had a more, I would say, sanguine view of the economic situation. And others, while acknowledging that there have been improvements on which I will say a few words later on in, uh, in, the, growth, uh, in the growth outlook, uh, believed that such improvements would not warrant any change in communication as far as the balance of risks are concerned. Uh, in the end, the Governing Council agreed about uh, this language that basically says that uh, um, the one I've read before, that says the risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook while moving towards a more balanced configuration are still tilted to the downside and related predominantly to global factors. You remember that in the previous formulation, we only said they remain tilted on the, on the downside. So the Governing Council agreed about this, and I should say all members of the Governing Council agreed about this formulation, so we can actually, uh, we can actually speak of unanimity in this. Oh, let me also add, let me also add that as far as inflation or risk to inflation outlook, there weren't really differing views. The behavior of inflation as it stands was basically shared by everybody. Okay, thank you, Andreas Ramke from Reuters in Frankfurt. Uh, let me follow up on the inflation uh, you mentioned uh, in January. I think you gave us four criteria for uh, the inflation that are needed or that become better uh, over the course of the time. Uh, I would be interested uh, in your assessment on these uh, four criteria. And my second question, a uh, very German uh, thing, uh, Mr. Schäuble was very, very critical uh, in Washington at the IMF meeting about your monetary policy, calling it not helpful. Uh, what is your reaction on this? Thank you. Um, as I said at the time, we don't comment politicians' statements about our monetary policy. Uh, and um, only to say that it's pretty um, ironic uh, to hear these comments from people who've supported independence of monetary policy, independence of central bank all throughout. But let me um, now say something about uh, inflation. Headline inflation declined stronger than expected in uh, March, reflecting lower inflation rates for all main components. And underlying inflation remained subdued. The short-term outlook was revised down due to lower oil prices and a weaker starting point for underlying inflation. Indicators of pipeline pressures show tentative signs of buildup of producer prices and upward pressure at the early stages of the pricing chain. Wage growth has been picking up slightly from a very subdued level yet the outlook for wage growth remains uncertain. So market-based expectations, uh, well, we can talk about the market-based expectations. So in terms of my criteria, the assessment hasn't really changed. 
The criteria are basically that the inflation path should converge towards our aim of an inflation rate of uh, below but close to 2%. It should be a durable convergence, so not essentially produced by transient factors like we've seen in the headline inflation recently. It should be, very importantly, should be self-sustained. The present inflation path is predicated on maintaining the uh, strong monetary accommodation in place, and uh, so the, the, the self-sustained means that it will stay there in, even without such strong monetary accommodation on our side. And of course, the inflation we talk about has to relate to the whole of the Eurozone and not one country only. Mr. Fairless. Thank you, Tom Fairless from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, my first question was on the sequencing of the um, exit uh, when, it, when it comes from QE. Um, you, uh, in your statement, you reiterated the forward guidance, but at the last meeting, you seemed to suggest there was some uh, room for flexibility there. My question was, um, is, is there any likelihood of a change? And um, is, is there kind of a gray area where the Put the uh, interest rates could be raised before the end of the net asset purchases, but after the QE has started to be wound down. Uh, my second question was on the, um, more generally, uh, it's, it's six years since uh, the ECB raised interest rates uh, just ahead of the Eurozone crisis, um, a decision that was uh, subsequently criticized. Um, in that case, you were, look, you were focusing very closely on inflation and you seem to miss or you subsequently uh, you criticized for missing the broader economic situation. Um, today, you're once again very focused on inflation and e even as the economy picks up, is, you know, how much of a risk is there that um, a similar policy mistake could be uh, repeated? Thanks. I'm not sure I get the logic of the second question, but I'll try to answer that anyway. Um, now, first of all, on the first question, uh, the sequencing, uh, I don't think there's any need to discuss this now. We have not seen any evidence or any sufficient evidence to alter our assessment about the inflation outlook. And uh, we are not sufficiently confident that inflation will converge to levels consistent with our inflation aim in a durable and self-sustaining manner. So from today's standpoint, there is no reason to deviate from the indications we have been consistently providing in the introductory statement to this press conference. But let me also just repeat what I said in the uh, speech at the ECB Watchers Conference. The Governing Council deems the current stance fully appropriate. It confirmed at its last meeting that net asset purchases will continue until the end of December 2017 or beyond. This implies that our various policy instruments are deliberately chained together in such a way that the forward guidance applied to our asset purchase program, which is time and state dependent, extends also to our interest rate policy. So our forward guidance is de facto on the entire package not on any specific component of it. And this guidance relates not just to the conditions under which we would withdraw stimulus, i.e. the sustained adjustment in the path of inflation, but also to the sequence of measures we would use to do so. So from today's perspective, the negative rates in conjunction with the other elements of our easing package have turned out to be powerful in terms of easing financial conditions, and the potential negative side effects have so far been limited. We can discuss this later. So the uh, current wording of our forward guidance reflects exactly this assessment of side effects. And from today's standpoint, I don't see cause to deviate from the indications we've been consistently providing in the introductory statement. <coughs> Now, the second question, uh, the logic of which, oh, oh yes, oh, yes, is the, ex well, I'll, I'll, if I can rephrase it, is the experience of uh, we had in 2011 uh, going to be repeated today? Uh, actually, I think it's the other way around. In 2011, uh, we forget, but we actually had a high rate of inflation for several months, above 2%. 
so that was the situation. We are now not having a high rate of inflation above 2%. We actually have a very subdued underlying inflation rate and volatile head infl headline inflation led by developing oil prices and uh, unprocessed food prices. So the situation is different. Thank you. Mr. Schroes. Mark Schröers, Börsenzeitung, thank you. Um, if, if I got it right, there's one sentence missing in the statement, and this is the sentence, there are no signs of yet of a convincing upward trend in underlying inflation. Um, what, what is the reason? No, I got it right? Wrong? Wrong? No, I think, no, you're right in the sense that there is one sentence less, but this one is there. In page, in page two, you have, moreover, the ongoing volatility in headline inflation underlines the need yeah, to look fact, we get to show a convincing, upward. convincing upward trend. If you read at the end of page one, beginning so of page no two. There's change in your assessment of the underlying inflation trend. That was finally the question. Yeah. Um, so that is that. No, the one that is not equal exactly like the other thing is the balance of risks uh, yeah. sentence, which repeated twice that the risks remain tilted on the downside in the last statement. And it's only once, you can find it only once in the second page. That's the difference. And the second question would be, um, what, uh, what is the governing council's estimate of the NIRU, of the equilibrium unemployment rate at the moment? Thank you. Well, we don't have an estimate of the NIRU at the moment. We, we, are, uh, we base our, um, our estimates on a variety of indicators. So in this sense, we avoid the trap of uh, being linked to a precise number which depends on a variety of factors. And we use a fairly uh, wide range of indicators to inspire and inform our policy making. Ms. Locke. Thank you. Hello, Mr. President. Um, you were talking about uh, the fact that risks are moving towards being more broadly balanced. Um, is that supposed to signal the slow beginning of a more substantial policy shift? And how do you feel about the consensus view that June might be a good moment to reassess um, the forward guidance? And uh, my second question is, in the past two days, including at last night's dinner, have you talked about uh, how you might eventually tackle an exit from stimulus and um, how you might communicate that? Tackle an exit from, from stimulus and, and how you will communicate that. Thank you. Thank you. No, we haven't discussed either today, but uh, let me give you just, but it's true that uh, the growth, uh, growth is improving. Things are going better. And, uh, and uh, you remember uh, in two th 2013, uh, uh, we were speaking of a, of, a, of a recovery which was fragile and uneven, and now it's solid and broad. And um, just let me give you a few numbers. The uh, growth uh, has averaged 0.4% uh, quarter after quarter since 2013. Uh, the, but the, the important point is also that this recovery has broadened, which wasn't the case before. We have, you know, I've, I think I've hinted at that or explained that in other occasions, we have a, a dispersion index of value-added growth showing how value-added grows in different countries, and now it's at historical minimum. It's at the same level as when in 1997. Um, the PMI is the highest since 2011, so is the economic sentiment index. The unemployment rate is at the lowest since May 2009, though it's still at 9.5%. And this may tell something, may tell something about the need to do structural reforms because there's no doubt that some of this unemployment is structural and, and not cyclical. And the employment figure is even more impressive. impressive. Uh, the euro area employment increased by almost 5 million jobs over the last three and a half years, offsetting virtually all of the employment losses seen over the crisis period. Now, incidentally here, um, the employment creation should benefit the poorer households. So this is a response to those who are criticizing our asset purchase program as increasing inequality. There is no better measure to improve 
inequality to improve equality, in fact, than increasing, increasing employment. And uh, in fact, consumption, which is the primary driver of this recovery, is led by an increase in real disposable income, which is led not so much by wage increases, but by employment gains. The risks of deflation have virtually disappeared. Market inflation, market-based inflation expectations, have, however, have shown a behavior which they, they have been increasing until February, then they declined. Now they kind of, they seem to be there. And now they, they do reflect an underlying behavior of the inflation risk premium, which uh, in turn reflects the mostly developments outside the Eurozone uh, in the United States, and perhaps some political uncertainty everywhere. However, the survey-based measures suggest that long-term inflation expectations have remained anchored. Also, the financing conditions uh, and credit demand uh, are going well. If you think the growth rate of credit has increased by five percentage points, going from negative to positive, by the way, in the last uh, three or four years. Also, uh, one of the symptoms of fragmentation, which was the difference in loan rates, both funding rates for banks and lending rates, uh, now has uh, somewhat disappeared. Basically, the spreads do, by and large, reflect different risk situation, risk premium. So all in all, uh, the also, even leverage, to some extent, has decreased, uh, in, especially in the private sector, in the NFC uh, part. Uh, now, so all in all, the improvements are, uh, are, are there, have been continuing, have been broadening, but we still have many fragilities, one of which, for speaking of leverage, is given by the fragility in the banking sector and the NPL stocks in many countries that could have a much higher credit growth if it not been for the, for the NPLs. Sorry? We haven't discussed that. No, I thought I answered that at the beginning, at the very beginning. Mr. Malin? Jan Marlin, Handelsblatt, uh, thank you. Um, have you discussed uh, today to change the forward guidance that uh, rates remain at uh, present or lower levels? And was there a broad majority to, to keep it as it is? And my second question, the ECB has somehow a track record of raising rates too early. Uh, in, in history, for example, in 2008 or in 2011. And there's also the experience of the taper tantrum in, in the US. Um, how much to, or to what extent does that play a role for, for your, um, or how does that affect your policies today, this experiences? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I think, uh, the, the answer to the second question is um, no, it doesn't affect. I mean, we are, uh, we are uh, young enough in our mental processes that we can uh, make a difference between uh, facts, assessments, and history. So uh, we, we judge and take our decisions based on the facts and on the analysis of the outlook. On the other point, we didn't discuss it. Uh, we didn't discuss it. And there was, uh, you see, most of the, actually, the discussion focused really on the, on, the, on the balance of risks concerning growth, not inflation. Your question is related to what we, what we call easing biases, no? Both the lower and the other. Now, the easing biases are actually linked to inflation. In other words, the easing biases are meant to cope with tail risks concerning the inflation rate, not growth directly. It's quite clear that as growth perspectives improve, certainly the probability of these tail risks may go down. But we are not there yet. Thank you. Mr. Daniels? 
Good afternoon. Uh, Harry Dang from Live Squawk News. Um, just to be clear, um, there were no discussions around, uh, about raising the deposit rate at the meeting over the last two days. Okay. And secondly, on the securities lending facility, um, there is a uh, sort of growing expectation that ECB could bring a more meaningful improvement to its securities lending conditions, as we saw at the back end of last year. Was that discussed, or is there any sort of a movement on that? You mean uh, better, better security lending? Securities lending? No, we didn't discuss this. But we, ha we have to um, accept the fact that the security lending is a decentralized activity that's carried out by the different national central banks, according to common guidelines, of course, but it's carried out by different national central banks, not at the ECB level. Thank you. Mr. Nelly? Alessandro Merli of Il Sole 24 Ore. Um, there is a mention of uh, global factors, and a while ago you also mentioned the United States. Uh, there was considerable uncertainty about uh, the policies of the uh, Trump administration. You just come back from Washington, where no doubt you've had contacts with uh, uh, members of the administration. Uh, did you get any further clarity on that uh, from your meetings in Washington or from their public pronouncements there? Well, uh not really. Um, we, we are, it, it would be, I think the main conclusion is that it would be premature to, um, to react or uh, make uh, policy decisions based on, a, on a future policies uh, pursued by the U.S. administration at this point in time. Um, we, we, we could say that one thing, perhaps, but I, I, one has to be very tentative in this. In this. One, one thing that may have come out of the meetings is that perhaps the risk of protectionism, or trade protectionism, may have somewhat receded. Uh, the second point is uh, that uh, certainly markets are in the course, not us, but, but markets are in the course of uh, a reassessment of uh, the uh, U.S. fiscal policy. And uh, I, frankly, wouldn't feel like going beyond that. Mr. Borderman. Thank you. Mark Borderman, uh, NRC Handelsblad. Um, Mr. Draghi, you just mentioned the uh, dispersion index on growth, which has improved, uh, but you also said there uh, was some discussion uh, in the Council today on how to um, value uh, economic growth at the moment in the Euro area. Um, um, in particular, in Italy, uh, GDP growth is still lagging behind, uh, so maybe even so that a tightening of monetary policy could come too soon. So my question is whether when deciding on the degree of uh, monetary policy accommodation in the, in, the, in the coming months, do you only look at averages of growth uh, or also at individual countries? Thank you. Well, you answered yourself. I mean, we look at averages. Our mandate is not expressed in any individual country uh, inflation. By the way, growth is not part of our mandate. So our mandate is price stability, and that is expressed in terms of the rate of inflation for the whole of the Eurozone. Mr. Perez. Hi, this is Claudio Perez from El País. Uh, the European Commission and the International Monetary Fund are talking clearly about the end of convergence of economic and social convergence in the Eurozone. Uh, do you feel that this trend could hamper, could reduce the support for the Euro uh, from the uh, European citizens, especially in the periphery, in the countries where the convergence has disappeared? Well, the, the, the support of the Euro, at least according the latest Eurobarometer estimates, remains pretty high. 
It's 70% across the Euro area, and it's more than 50% in all countries, each and every one. So according to this measure, uh, the support for the Euro is still very strong. Uh, to ignore the uh, social uneasiness would also be a mistake, and I think both the IMF and especially the European Commission are quite uh, quite right about being uh, aware and alert to this. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite clear now, everybody would acknowledge that the globalization had extraordinary benefits, but also created, uh, a, created losers that uh, were not taken into account uh, for several years and uh, were not, uh, was not considered. Now, it, the commission especially, I think rightly so, uh, doesn't uh, at all backtrack from the benefits of globalization. That would not be the right, uh, right way to go. But uh, certainly should uh, have a much greater social consideration for the ones who don't gain or actually get harmed by the globalization. Mr. Jakes? Klaus and Ayakish, AD German Television. Mr. President, I would like to touch on a point you're repeating for many years. That is um, uh, the fact that uh, you constantly ask um, member states and politicians to help uh, your policy uh, by reforms and structural reforms and so on. Given the fact that unfortunately we don't really see any of this help and looking at the four criteria you have outlined, how confident is the ECB Council to reach those criteria if there's a continuation uh, in, in this lack of support from the political side. And secondly, given that you, of course, have a kind of neutral and independent position, is there any way for the ECB uh, to trigger such political support? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I will answer the second question. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we, are, uh, we have different roles, different tasks. And, uh, um, but going to the first question, well, first, uh, the, some structural reforms had been undertaken uh, in, uh, in the past few years in uh, several, several countries in, uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, so the picture is not uniformly bleak. But it's also true that of recent, the pace has slowed down. Now, to, uh, and, and well, I'll say a word why this is so, but to, just to, to give you an example of why they are so necessary. One of the problems that uh, has the Eurozone, Europe in general, is low productivity. It's, uh, it's now quite uh, established that uh, the productivity, the, um, the largest part of the gains in productivity are obtained by transfer of technology from the more efficient companies, firms, to the less efficient ones. So not so much by innovation, at least in Europe, also by innovation, but mostly by transfer. In order to allow this transfer to happen, there must be a business environment, an economic environment, which is conducive to produce such a transfer. And that's where the structural reforms come very useful to create this environment where this transfer could happen and therefore productivity could increase with corresponding increase in wages. Finally, uh, it's quite clear that once the countries enter into a very important political and election cycle, the push for legislating structural reforms becomes less so, becomes less vigorous. However, this that by itself doesn't justify any absence of action because even without legislation, you have implementation of previously legislated reforms. And frankly, it's common assessment that in some countries there is a lot to, to do in terms of implementation, even without thinking about new legislation. That's why, although knowing, although aware that the political conditions aren't there, for legislating, the, the ECB continues to renew the appeal, the plea, to undertake structural reforms. Ms. Thier? 
Uh, Jenny Thiel, Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung. Mr. Draghi, um, you listed a lot of factors that are important for your monetary policy decisions. And I was wondering how important is the political uncertainty and, and risk for your assessment for that? I mean, you mentioned um, um, that you don't do monetary policy um, on the outcome of the election. So I was wondering about that. As a matter of fact, yes, we don't do monetary policy on, on the likely outcomes of elections. Uh, but, but you see, we, of course we ask ourselves how much does political uncertainty, can, how, how political uncertainty can affect our monetary policy decisions. Of course we ask ourselves this question. Um, and the answer is uh, to the extent and only to the extent that we don't react to political uncertainty by itself. But we certainly internalize the information that comes from the fact that political uncertainty may affect our medium-term outlook for price stability. So to the extent that political uncertainty has this effect, we internalize this information, and, and we, together with lots of other information, in, making our, in taking our monetary policy decisions. Mr. Mr. Ewing? Uh, Jack Ewing, New York Times. Um, Mr. Draghi, I wanted to go back to the, uh, the phrase you added about uh, the risks are related to, downside risks are related to, to global factors. I wonder if you could elaborate on what that means exactly, what types of global factors. Is it a political risk that you just mentioned? Is it North Korea? Is it US tax policy? Um, and yes, that's my question. Thank you. You. Well, it's a, it's a broad category that, um, uh, well, first of all, we have two sets of risks. One is linked to global factors. The other one is more domestic. Uh, one interesting fact is that over the last, over the past few months, the balance between these two risks has uh, slightly changed in a sense that domestic sources of risk have diminished and uh, global, geo-global, Source of risk have increased, and um, and they have um, some of them are exactly the ones you you exemplified a moment ago, but others, for example, have to do with uh, how the UK economy will be doing in the post Brexit. Uh, we we always assumed that uh, that in fact I mean we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, uh, think that it's over. Of course, the the consequences, especially the trade linkages are there, were there, and uh, are going to be uh, a source of uh, a channel of uh, economic consequences coming from this. Of course, the final outcome will depend on the shape that the final negotiation will have, how long it will take. But it's quite clear that even now, this uncertainty about the length and the shape is producing economic consequences. So that's another, another, uh, another source. But the other, the other factors is that are really very much what you exemplified before. And add to this also possible, uh, possible uh, negative surprises in some uh, emerging market economies. That's also a source. We shouldn't forget that in 2016, early 2016, uh, the beginning of the year, we had, uh, we had big worries, if you remember, about what was happening in China. The situation has improved since then but uncertainties remain. Mr. Lacour? Jean-Philippe Lacour, now for, for the French news agency AFP. Uh, my compliments, Mr. Draghi, because all the political risk-related questions, we, you never uh, mentioned France uh, in the answer, so let me try again. Uh, you know, in 10 days, we have this uh, final duel between a candidate uh, favorite in the polls, pro-European, young ex-banker, and uh, Miss Le Pen pledging for uh, leaving the Eurozone. So. I would, I would just want to ask uh, how comfortable is the Governing Council with uh, this possible situation and if even it was assessed during the discussion, the possible outcome of the vote, and does that um, have a role in the overall uh, assessment of the situation regarding the risks? And maybe just a second question to understand you well. On page one, 
when, you, when the statement says that, that the downside risk are further dim, diminished, it's just relies to the uh, present situation of the recovery, and then the risk uh, tilted to the downside uh, that uh, is relied to the uh, future, so the, the outlook. Is, it, uh, is this the difference between present and future? Because for me, it's not really clear. Thank you. Um, now, the answer to the first question is, uh, in a sense, I've answered before. But let me summarize saying that um, in the governing council meetings, we discussed we discussed policies, not politics. And uh, as far as the second uh, point, uh, let's read it together. Since our meeting in early March confirmed that the silk recovery of the euro area economy is becoming increasingly solid. So it's a, it's a process in, in evolution. And, and that downside risks have further diminished. So it takes stock about uh, downside risks. So far, they have diminished. And, uh, and, the, and the cyclical recovery is becoming increasingly solid. So it's, it's an evolution that we, uh, we see fr from, uh, from survey data uh, could continue. Thank you. So we have the final question. Ms. Weisbach, please. Uh, governing Council meeting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, well, I have my own headline, but what would, would be yours um, from yesterday's and today's discussion from that meeting? And the second question, sorry, I need to get, go back to the sequencing element. Uh, during the ECB Watchers Conference, I had the impression that you were quite adamant uh, about the sequencing issue that before any rate will move, you'll end your asset purchase program. Today, it sounds different, um, perhaps not. And if so, perhaps you could elaborate. And the headline first. <laughs> well, the headline, the headline really is this. The risk surrounding the euro area growth outlook, while moving towards a more balanced configuration, are still tilted to the downside and relate predominantly to global factors. That's the, that's the headline. No, the uh, short, uh, short. Uh, well, you work, you work it out. The um, on the second point, I know I, I just wanted to reread the speech of the ECB Watchers Conference so that as to make absolutely clear there is no difference on the sequence. Okay. I, yeah, that's what it says. That's what it says. Yeah, that's what it says, and that's what the introductory statement says. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.